Hey, I'm Paul Begay, ASC Systems Designer. We are uh, with Craig Lawson again from Gulf Coast Research Lab, and we are going to be going into a kind of a tight room inside with a very tall tank. Um, that's where the breeding is going to be going on for triple tail. So if we look here, we have a familiar friend. This is the bubble bead filter. Uh, Craig, this is going to be for uh, primarily solids capture for here. And then what other filtration is on this system? It's a single loop system. We have this as our primary clarifier, like you said. Yeah. We also have biological filtration in the form of another moving bed bioreactor. We have uh, another protein fractionator, protein skimmer. Yeah. And we have a UV sterilizer in there as well. Okay, so uh, there was the previous video that we did on the triple tail grow out. Same filtration is used. Again, saltwater systems between 18 and 24 parts per thousand for that system. Are we about uh, at that here or are we going to be raising our salinity or lowering our salinity for the breeding process? This system is going to be experimental so there may be some trials involving heightened or lowered salinity. I'd say it would go anywhere between 12 and 30. Okay, and any issues with the filtration, like when you're sizing a filter, uh, whether it's a, a bead filter or a moving bed reactor, protein skimmer, um, what types of things do you think about um, with an increase in salinity, just from your experience? From my experience, salinity is not going to play as much of a factor as system capacity, okay. sizing for the rest of your peripherals, pump capacity, that right. sort of thing. Right, right, okay, okay. And then um, we did go past um, a liquid oxygen containment system, and that liquid oxygen is gonna be supplying oxygen for this system, or is that just for those other buildings that we were looking at? The liquid oxygen system connects to every building on campus and right. serves as an emergency backstop right. in case we lose power. Right. We actually have a, a system of solenoids that connects to our oxygen ducts, and those kick on whenever power goes off, allowing us to provide pure oxygen to systems that would wind up not having any circulation. Or no filtration. flow, no filtration. However, okay. we can use it to add oxygen and inject it directly to the system. Okay, most of the aeration is still coming from a regenerative blower just on the back side of the building. Okay, yes. through manifolds and air stones normally. Yes. Um, uh, remind me to take a hard look at uh, some of the space cones that you have with the propeller bead filters. We're, that, that's just another way of supplying oxygen to a recirculating aquaculture system. So, um, look, I'm excited to go in and see. This is a very tall, very large volume tank uh, with some really cool uh, possibilities for breeding triple tail. All right, so let's go inside. Okay, so uh, we're now inside of the triple tail breeding room. Take a look at the height of this tank. Tell me, what are the dimensions and what's the approximate volume inside of this tank? Uh, the tank's about 12 foot deep, 10 foot diameter, and uh, I'm not terribly sure what volume that is. Right, right. This is, but this is big. And um, generally, what's the reason for making this tank so large? This is primarily going to be a research tank because not a whole lot's known about the spawning habits of our species for triple tail. Uh -huh. So we didn't attempt to spawn them in the tanks that we were holding them in that you saw earlier. Right. And we were more of a shallow tank. Yes, much more okay. of a shallow tank. And we made some experimental attempts at refining the method for getting them to spawn consistently. Uh -huh. This is sort of the next step in that. Right. We're going to go from a variable that's going to be flat in terms of depth to one where they could potentially mimic the more natural swimming patterns, of swimming down to spawn, coming back up. Interesting, so interesting. And this is referred to the previous video on uh, triple tail from GCRL um, concerning kind of when that spawning is going to be going on. They're going to have a spring spawn. So they're probably now, correct me if I'm wrong, you're gearing up now maybe acclimating this system so that you can get some of those fish from the previous uh, uh, video and the, the other building to get them into here. And so that'll be 
Um, low densities, is she gonna be what? One female in here, multiple males, or how are you working that? Uh, to start off with, I think they would do at least one breeding pair, so right. two males, two females. Right. But uh, I, you'd have to refer to the PI's actual research plan for that. Sure, sure, sure. However, this, the timing of the build on this tank was crucial because we really did want to get this tank up and running, cycled, and ready for fish so that we could have them as soon as possible to monitor their behavior process. Cycling process. So um, when you get water into a tank like this, acclimating the biofilter, what type of time do you uh, allot for uh, filter acclimation? Give me, just give me a little bit about what you do there. Okay, well that will largely depend on the volume of the tank itself, mm -hmm. the volume of your filtration, the type of filtration used, that sort of thing. With the moving bed bioreactor being the star of the biological loop for this, or the biological portion of the loop for this system, right? Uh, I would ideally want to give it between three and six weeks, mm -hmm. but that's that's totally subjective. It's just based on my experience with tanks of this size, right? So it you know largely depends on the parameters of your system, the density of the uh, organism that you're going to be using, sure, the type of organism, and your feeding schedule as well. Sure, sure, sure. And again, this would be lightly stocked. So getting that biofilter nearly acclimated in, um, like Craig said, in that three weeks, um, typically what you really want to do is make sure that you're taking your water quality testing prior to getting animals, especially when they're really important animals. So uh, acclimating your biofilter. Please refer to those videos. But let's take a look, just like with the other system, we're going to take a look at some of the paired components that you will use um, when you're running a system like this. You've got your bead filter that we said is primarily acting as your clarifier with any biological filtration that you get from your bead filter being just extra. Um, next, we've got, I can see a UV sterilizer, another protein skimmer, and then a moving bed reactor. So why don't you take us through uh, those, uh, just give us some of the parameters there and kind of why we use them. Okay. Uh, the protein skimmer is fed primarily off of pump bypass that we have coming off of the pump immediately. Mm -hmm. So the system is all one giant loop, which is kind of in contrast to the systems that we saw. But the single loop has to be fragmented into a couple of different areas so that we can fit all of our system peripherals on there. Right. Protein skimmer is going to largely be on its own, on its own section of the loop when it comes off of that filter bypass. Right. But it's again going to filter out your fine solids and your large organics that are just going to be dumped down the drain once it uh, bubbles over. Dumped out, right? And your UV that's hidden just underneath here, that UV is um, uh, the job that it's doing in a breeding system. Talk a little bit about that. In a breeding system, we really want the water quality to be immaculate right That's without microbes without any algae that might accumulate from light growth or any extraneous why why would yeah why do we want that water to be so immaculate the fish in order to get spawns that are of the highest quality that yeah. we can possibly obtain in an unnatural setting yeah. we want the fish to be as comfortable as possible right so, eliminating stress eliminating stress and we're going to want to eliminate as much waste or potential stressors on the fish right. as possible. Right, right, right. Okay, awesome. Let's go up top, and we're going to take a look at the top of the tank. And well, it's pretty cool. We're going to open the, the lid of the tank. We're going to look down, and we're going to be able to see all the way down through this window right here. So, uh, so Craig, I'm going to follow you up those stairs, my man. I'm gonna open this up. No fish in here right now, so we're not gonna be disturbing anything. We're in, uh, how far into our acclimation are we? This is about the third week of cycling. Okay. And as far as I know, we're probably going to go all the way to six. Okay, all right. So here we go. So we're gonna open this up. Oh, jeez. I gotta, I gotta lift both hands. All right, here we go. So that's our window on the far side. 
lights on the inside. No fish in here, but when fish come in, what size fish are we going to uh, see in here? And um, like you said, you're going to have probably two breeding pairs. So these are going to be the largest fish, like the ones we saw earlier, or, or how does that work? Uh, not necessarily. Uh, through morphometrics and blood drawing, our PI has established which fish are most likely to breed. Okay. Most of the fish that are most likely in season as well. So he's going to choose from a roster of those fish that are most likely to pair with each other, bring them in here. And, and what do we know about sexual maturity of triple tail? Is it a, a two years before they get sexually mature? Is it less? Uh, that's also an emerging field. Right. Because we've gone through and sized a couple of different fish using blood draws to test for sexual maturity. Yeah. And they've actually cannulated them to try to figure out what sex they are. And some of the smaller fish have actually shown signs of maturity and some of the larger fish have not yet differentiated. Right. Tell the audience what cannulating means. Cannulating involves a, uh, a long syringe with a, a piece of tubing at the end of it that is actually inserted into the fish to test the gonad tissues to determine its type. So females will produce eggs and fluid ejecta and males you'll be able, you won't even have to cannulate. You can usually just uh, strip them to produce sperm. Okay, good, good. All right, so um, we're really excited about this coming up. Um, and does anybody ever get inside of this tank? Uh, so far, only one person has had to get into this tank. But Who's that? That's, that's me. That was you? Yeah. Why'd you have to get in there? You had to do some we filled plumbing? It before I uh, finished install on some of the key parts, most notably the drain baffle at the bottom. So. <laughs> take care of that and then we have to do a pipe installation in there okay all right good so let's take a look at the biological filter here okay so uh we're still next to our breeding tank here and we're looking at our moving bed reactor so why don't you talk a little bit about a uh, moving bed reactor what type of media you use why you size it the way that you do our moving bed bioreactors are our main source of biological filtration. And the way that they work is that water is pumped in here to a large media chamber that contains these beads. Now, the beads can be differentially shaped and sized according to the size and requirements of your system. And as you can see on some of these beads, they start out this clear or whitish plastic, and some of them are starting to turn brown. Now, that brown stuff on them is what's known as biofilm and it is a beneficial series of strains of bacteria that uh, nitrify and denitrify the water. And um, refer to some of the videos that we have about the beads of the ASC bead filter doing the exact same thing, creating that biofilm. So in a large system like this, they are separating some of the system processes into uh, the bead filter being the clarifier uh, with some biological filtration, but the moving bed reactor taking care of um, the brunt of the biological filtration. And because this is a large tank with not too many fish in there, our biological load is going to be pretty small here. But again, y'all are sizing this so that we make sure that the water is pristine, no stress on the animals so that they breed. That's correct. All right. It also serves the dual fold purpose of being able to serve as a housing unit for larger amounts of fish. If right. You size it. Sure. To accommodate a larger bio load. We can maybe hold fish in here if you had to, because you've got a biological filter that can handle a, a higher bio load. Absolutely. Okay. Good. 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 So, um, is there anything else that we need to look at in this system? Um, I would say the egg collection which is kind of the star point of this system. Great. Uh, it's fed through our side box here. And the side box drains down underneath, pumps water up through into this egg collector here. Okay, so the water is going to be uh, coming through the side box. Any eggs that um, uh, are in the water column in the large tank are going to be coming fed from this side box and then fed up through into this egg collection tank? That's correct. Okay, so what's going on with this screen and where does it go during normal operation? 
That screen, when we're in the process of egg collecting, is going to fit right onto this bracket here, and it's actually going to serve as a baffle that stops any eggs that are pumped into this part of the tank from leaving. Now, water is going to be coming in here and then is going to be leaving there. Out through this section. Yeah. So you would be uh, pulling the screen and collecting the eggs. Now, where do the eggs go in uh, uh, once they're collected here? Once they're collected, they'll be taken to our hatchery, and from there, they'll be taken to a nursery facility. They're always um, assessed first to determine viability, uh, fertilization rates, and there's a number of uh, measurements that we collect off of the eggs once the, they're taken out of the system in order to uh, establish their viability. Right. And that's, that is something that is uh, such an important part of aquaculture, understanding that uh, when doing in-tank breeding, catching those eggs, testing for viability, and then what we do with those uh, eggs that end up becoming larvae, how we treat them is so important for the viability of not just uh, those animals, but the viability of uh, potentially an entire industry. So this is an extremely important part of this process that is is taken very, very seriously. So uh, Craig, man, um, thanks again for showing us around. I really appreciate it. This system's awesome. I'm really looking forward to seeing it in operation. Thanks so much and tune in for more videos from Gulf Coast Research Lab coming up.